When day turns to night and the moon is most bright, shed the king of you and wear the queen. The nine realms will open and your magic be free. Adam couldn't master witchcraft no matter how hard he tried. Until the goddess Freya showed him the power deep inside. By the silvery light of the moon he began to change his form. Transported to a mystic realm, a heroine was born. Nova Jupiter Jenkins, Nova Jupiter Jenkins, guardian of the endless library halls. Nova Jupiter Jenkins, Nova Jupiter Jenkins. Hi, my bling. It's your favorite drag witch, Nova Jupiter Jenkins. My friends call me Nova JJ, and you can too. Welcome back. Or if you're just joining us for the first time, welcome front. And for those of you who are just joining us for the first time, here's a quick recap. So back in the mundane realm, also known as Earth, my alter ego Adam was having a hard time tapping into his magical power until the goddess Freya advised him to get in touch with his feminine side. So he put on the best drag he could, cast a little spell, and was transported here to a magical realm I call the Heath. And he was transformed into me, otherworld-renowned drag witch and book hunter extraordinaire, Nova JJ. I work at an infinite library called Kalamudutu, and when I'm stuck personing the information desk, I record this podcast. From time to time, I'm also joined by my two darling minions. They are Adam's cats back in the mundane, but here they are half raven, half feline familiars called Hugo and Munzi. So you might hear them kicking around. Of course, that doesn't cover what's been happening since the podcast started, but more on that in a bit. It's been a long, hot, terrible summer for a lot of us, but the equinox is just around the corner and hopefully the autumn winds are ready to shift our luck. Not only that, but it's a Friday the 13th full moon. I have so much to catch you up on. But first things first, I made a few changes around here. As I'm sure you've noticed, we got a theme song. Composed by the insanely talented Robin Slack, with vocals by him and his equally talented wife, Lena Anderson. You may know Robin from his critically acclimated musical duo, Success 5000, and Lena from the improv and sketch comedy scene in and around Edmonton, Alberta. If you want to check out more of their awesomeness, you can visit the links in the show notes for this episode. A couple other changes. I'm not going to be mentioning the names of the moons this season. Apart from not wanting to continue to engage in cultural appropriation, I've decided we've been there and done that, and I'm over it. I'm also not going to be doing a general tarot reading. As some people pointed out, doing a reading for the entire world is problematic at best. I originally thought, hey, if horoscopes can do it, but I guess two vague divinatory practices don't make a right. There may be an opportunity for me to do personal tarot readings for listeners down the road, uh, but for this season I wanted to take a different approach. So for each episode, I'd like to discuss a specific tarot card drawn at random and look closer at its meaning, as well as tie story time into the theme of the tarot card when possible. In an effort to make the ghosts of the library more audible, or audible at all during the full moon, I've tweaked the spell that records the podcast, and while I wasn't able to get them to be audible, sorry, Yerald and Gulia, you may hear more ambient noises from the library. Yerald, I promise, I tried. It's been a busy summer. I didn't exactly have time for a lot of research. And I know I told everyone that Yerald's yarns would be out, but I sort of forgot that we need Adam on the other side of things to upload the audio files once I magic them over. But I hope you had a good time haunting the library over the summer. Um, aren't you on a permanent vacation? Oh, the librarians actually made it so you could travel away from the library for a short while? That's an uncharacteristic amount of generosity. Well, I guess if you put it that way, I'd do the same thing. Anyway, we'll work on those yarns on the next new moon. Anyway, another change for the season is that you may hear me talk about current events in the mundane realm a bit more. 
Things have been so terrible over there, I hadn't wanted to rub it in, but it's hard to witness what's happening and not say anything. But more on that later. For now, let's jump into tarot time. The card for today's episode is the Two of Scepters, or as it's most commonly known, the Two of Wands. Some decks also refer to this suit as staves. And as different decks have different names for the suits, they may also have variations on the meaning of the cards. I'm going to be providing the meaning and understanding that I've developed for the card, but you're most welcome to shower me with your own interpretations as long as you keep it classy. Externally, this card can represent two forces that are at cross purposes. Usually the querent and someone who is trying to meddle in the querent's life, especially as it pertains to the matter in question. Internally, the two of scepters can represent a crossroads. The querent will usually need to choose between a path that is safe and comfortable, but further away from the seeker's goal, or the path with a greater risk and greater reward. Even though I'm talking about the cards individually, it is important to remember that their context within the spread Will have an impact on the card's meaning. And of course, for specific spreads, there's a different meaning if the card shows upside down, in what we call the reverse position. Many people assume that the reverse meaning of the card is negative, but that's not always the case. With the Two of Wands, as opposed to being at cross purposes, the reverse card can represent two people working toward the same goal, or internally, that the way forward is clear. For our first story time back, I'm going to jump into first grade mode as I present How I Spent My Summer Vacation by Nova Jupiter Jenkins. You may remember last year, after having been attacked multiple times by Lilt the Hagibus and the unnamed warlock I met on my first trip to the Heath, I was going to lay low for a bit and stay out of the Heath, and Adam was going to do some traveling in the mundane. My main goal was to distance myself from the people in the heath who were in danger of getting caught in the crossfire. The other goal was for Adam to draw Lilt's attention with his dreamy dreams. After he had originally realized that he was being attacked by a hacubus, he created some protection spells to keep her out of his dreams at home. It would have looked suspicious if those protections had suddenly disappeared, so he went on a little camping trip and conveniently forgot the protection charms. While camping, he did some walking in nature, some meditating, and some chanting, which induced the juiciest dreams that Lilt could not resist. So she came to feast, and Adam was ready. In the dream, Adam was the vizier to a despotic king, and when Lilt showed up, Adam explained to the king that Lilt was a spy from an enemy land, and she was immediately seized and locked away in the dungeon. I know what you're thinking. What does that matter if it's just a dream, right? Well, part of being powerful in the dream world is that you're also susceptible to its pitfalls, at least until you learn the rules well enough to break them. Someone as powerful a Hagibus as Lilt wouldn't generally be held in a simple dream dungeon, but that wasn't the only thing waiting for her. Part of the meditating and chanting that Adam was doing was to create what's called the Somnium Carcerum, It's a special trap within a dream that acts kind of like a holodeck that keeps shifting the scenario of the dream, which in turn shifts the rules, and keeps Lilt from being able to adapt to them. It even keeps operating on the dream plane after the dreamer awakens. Like before, it's not a permanent fix. I'm sure she'll find her way out eventually. But it was enough to keep her out of my hair while I dealt with our other little friend. Now, the warlock was not going to be able to be dealt with from outside the heath. And you may or may not have noticed, but there was something special about the month of August. There were two new moons in the month. That's called a black moon as opposed to the blue moon when there are two full moons. This is particularly auspicious when you're actively engaged in conflict. There's a ritual that's unique to the heath. 
It's fairly complicated and has three distinct parts, one performed on the first new moon, one performed on the full moon, and one performed on the final new moon. We call it the Oreo Maneuver. Don't ask what it was called before Oreos were invented. Anyway, so the ritual is a sort of summoning spell that pulls the subject of the spell from wherever they may be to a location of the spell caster's choosing for a duel of sorts. I originally returned to the heath with the intention of casting the spell to bring the warlock to me, but decided that he would probably be attempting the same ritual and that it would be better to allow myself to be summoned. If we summoned each other, who knows what might have happened. So I spent my time in the heath parting it up and letting it be known that I was on vacation and relaxing. I also may have spent some less public time working on secret presents for my impending reunion. Gifts tend to be a bit more difficult when you don't know the name of the individual for whom they're being made, so sometimes you have to get creative. I had my battle athame, of course, which I mentioned back in episode 15 of last season. In that episode, I talked about how a special layer of wax allowed me to carve runes for a secondary spell on the athame that would help me to track down my enemies. This time, I carved a spell into the wax that would transform the athame into Sword of Starfire the second I was attacked. And, of course, I carried a shield made out of one of Peggy's baby teeth. For our newcomers, Peggy is the guardian of the main entrance of the library, and her teeth are no joke, even the baby ones. I prepared a few more gifts just to make sure I was prepared for anything, but as it turns out, I overprepared. Some warlocks are such idiots. As predicted, he completed the Oreo maneuver and summoned me to duel, and as also predicted, he tried to attack me as I materialized before I could get my bearings. And even though I should have predicted, I underestimated how close he would want to be to me when he attacked, presumably to finish the job of draining my power that he tried on our first encounter. As soon as I appeared, he was there, attacking me. And of course, that activated the spell on the Batame, and... Before I knew it, a foot of Starfire Blade had shot right through his chest. It happened so fast, before I could blink, off went his head. Kind of disappointing, really. I showed up to fight and was met with premature decapitation. Ah oh, well, you lose some, you obliterate others. And so here we are, back in business. And now it's time for Craft Corner. Usually on the full moon episodes, I like to talk about yarn craft and save the magical crafts for the new moon. This time I decided to combine them and talk about a particular spell you can do using yarn, or as some people prefer, ribbon. And that's a binding spell. Many believe that the yarn or ribbon has to be white in order for the spell to be effective. But what's really important is that the color be an effective conduit of your power. Some find the white light of the combined spectrum to be the most effective. Some people tap into the absence of light and prefer black, while others use specific colors that represent the strength of their will. Someone whose will is like the unstoppable flame might use a red ribbon, whereas others whose will is like the relentless sea might use a blue ribbon, and so on. Binding spells are often frowned upon because they interfere with the will of another, which is a big no-no in many magical philosophies. I feel that if someone is using their will to harm others, defensive action is more than appropriate. Some world leaders, for example, I mean arguably all of them, but certain incompetent, delusional, corrupt, evil jars of orange marmalade that have sat in a mildewy basement for too long and turned into a putrescent sack of rotten garbage with legs and a Twitter account, some of those need something done. Those of you coming of age in the mid-90s may remember a charming little film called The Craft, which featured this spell. Even though that was fiction and this is real life, it doesn't mean that the spell can't be effective. The writers got it from somewhere, after all. So to enact the binding, you need to have an image or effigy of the subject of the spell, and you take the yarn or ribbon and slowly but tightly wrap the yarn around the effigy. Every time you wrap around, you say... I bind you, subject. I bind you from harming yourself and from harming others. 
That's the general wording anyway. Sometimes certain words get left out. But you repeat until the image is covered, and then you tie off the yarn so that it doesn't unravel. After I'm done, I prefer to bury the effigy in the ground for good measure. Now, one person completing the spell may not have the strongest effect, but if a group of people were to combine their efforts, anything is possible. Well, I hope you've enjoyed our first episode back. It would help out a lot if you were to like, share, comment, and subscribe on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you listen. And remember, one voice in the darkness can change a life, but a chorus of thousands can change the world. Bye, my bling! You re- <clears throat>